Welcome to the Cambridge Financial Podcast with Bert Salazar, CEO at Cambridge Financial Partners, LLC. This podcast is all about tax-preferred retirement planning, economics, financial risk management, and achieving a risk-free and successful financial life. Now, your host, Bert Salazar. Bert Salazar. Hey, good day, everyone. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. It's actually Thursday, November 26, 2020. So it is uh, Thanksgiving Day, and I want to wish you all the the very, very best. And now I know that some of you are going to be saying, well, Bert, you know, what the heck are you doing uh, doing a podcast on Thanksgiving Day? Well, you know, at the end of the day, duty calls. And since I promise each and every one of you that every week you are going to, to have a podcast from me, then obviously duty calls, so I'm here once again, but I'll have plenty of time to enjoy my family and the turkey and um, uh, a little bit of drinking here and there, so I'm excited about that. Uh, One of the things I do want to ask you to do is, you know, as a U.S. Marine, I was um, a number of times away from home during during the holidays, and it was not an easy time for me, so I ask uh, that, that you, you know, give it a little bit of thought and a prayer to all our military personnel that, you know, are somewhere in the world uh, trying to defend and protecting the way the way we live and the way uh, our way of life. Uh, so, if you have a thought in your prayers and you want to uh, do something for these military personnel, then. I would truly appreciate that, and I, in, deep down inside, I think they would appreciate that as well. So uh, with that being said, uh, once again, I'm hoping that all of you are having a great day today and that you're going to be spending uh, Thanksgiving with your family and, uh, and good friends and that you stay safe uh, because we're getting very, very close to, to the end of uh, this nightmare that we have been living through in 2020. Vaccines are right around the corner, so... I'm hoping that 2021 is going to bring us uh, a tremendous amount of benefit and success and happiness uh, to all of us. So I wish each and every one of your um, your families the very, very best uh, for this uh, Thanksgiving uh, day. Now, uh, today's episode is one that I have been asked to do uh, a few times. And, you know, life gets in the way, so I've been putting it off. But I thought that this would be a good week you know, to kind of talk a little bit about that. By the way, this is episode 137. So once again, I want to thank you all uh, for being loyal and and listening to my podcast on a weekly basis. We get more and more people listening every single week. And today's uh, podcast is uh, the impact of the gold standard on the U.S. economy. You know, as you know, we had the gold standard for many, many years. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of the gold standard. And then I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about why we're having this conversation about gold today. And then last but not least, you know, what are some of the things that you may want to consider doing uh, in preparation for what's uh, inevitably uh, coming down the pike at some point in time in the very, very near future. So uh, talking a little bit about the history of the, the gold standard, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'm just going to give you some of the bullet points that I think are important for for all of you and for all of us to understand. Uh, The gold standard uh, was first placed into operation in the United Kingdom in in 1821. So it goes back to Europe and uh, and England and the United Kingdom back in 1821. And the reason for that was that the gold could be bought and sold in unlimited quantities at a fixed price. So if you wanted to buy gold, you could do so, and there was a fixed price, and you know, you could save your money and then exchange it for gold and, and, and have gold as part of your possession. Now, it could be purchased in convertible paper money per unit uh, weight of, of the metal. So, you know, the way that you would purchase it is uh, you would use paper money and then you would buy it um, uh, per ounce uh, and then you can acquire as much of it as you want to. There was no limit as to how much gold uh, you were able to, to purchase back in the 1800s. Now, in, 18, 20, in 1834, so we're talking about just um, a little bit over a decade later, uh, in 1834, the United States uh, fixed the price of gold at $20.67 per ounce. Uh, and it actually remained that, well, that way until 1933. So from 1834, 
1933, almost 100 years, uh, the price of gold uh, never changed. It was always at $20.67. Now, central banks uh, could exchange gold for convertible paper uh, money at, uh, at the fixed rate of $35 per ounce. So not the public, but the, the, the government was able, and the central banks were able to uh, exchange this for $35 per ounce. Now, this option was not available to, to individuals or firms. Uh, it was primarily available to the central banks and banks in the United States and some of the central banks that we did business with uh, throughout the world. Now, another thing that's interesting uh, to note is that you know, since the value of the U.S. dollar was tied to, to the amount of gold in reserves, um, it actually provided uh, a tremendous amount of uh, stability uh, and also created uh, scarce resources, be resources because, you know, gold uh, was not extremely abundant. I mean, there was all, only so much of it. Now, obviously, you could continue to look for gold, but because of the fact that it was a tangible uh, item, then uh, it created a scarce resource, uh, which is what economics is all about, uh, and that's important to note. Um, money cannot, uh, money could not increase in circulation without the backing of a similar amount in gold. So, uh, because of the fact that our U.S. dollar uh, was tied to to the gold standard. Uh, then once again, you know, money could not be increased in circulation until, unless you had a similar amount uh, in order to cover, in order to back uh, that dollar uh, with uh, gold. So in many different ways, it actually held inflation in check and, and prevented the government uh, from overspending, which is something that, you know, many of us uh, today, when we look at, you know, the debt that we have in, the, in this country, we wish uh, we would have never gotten away from the, from the gold standard. Now, in 1933, and this is another interesting point for all of you, uh, the U.S. abandoned the gold standard. And, and completed and completely cuts uh, actually and, com and completely cut its tie to to gold in 1971. So uh, it was abandoned in 1933, but then finally in 1971, under the Nixon President Nixon administration, then we completed uh, cut ties uh, with uh, the gold standard. Now. Uh, the Great Depression, in many different ways, and depending on um, uh, the experts and, and who it is that you're that, that you're reading or listening to, but the Great Depression was the main cause uh, for the U.S. to part ways with the gold standard. Uh, and and then obviously, in order to protect the gold supply, President Roosevelt, at that time, allowed the government to pump paper money into the economy at lower interest rates in order to accelerate the economy. Uh, you know, I always say that you got to be careful what you wish for because uh, because although the gold standard had nothing to do with us going into the Great Depression, the U.S. government at that time felt that, you know, if we were part of the gold standard, then our hands were going to be tied. So there was going to be so much that we could do uh, in order to, to you know, kind of... Uh, accelerate uh, the the uh, the economy in order to make it better at that point in time. So, uh, because we were tied to the gold standard, uh, it became al almost an impossibility for us to be able to get out of the Great Depression uh, without having the ability to pump a lot of money in, in order to to enhance the economy. But once again, as I said a couple of seconds ago, uh, be careful what you wish for, because I think in many different ways now we have it. So uh, once we got away from the gold standard, what did that mean? Well, it actually meant that the U.S. dollar actually became uh, what is known as uh, fiat. Fiat money, money was immediately created. And, and the definition of fiat is paper currency created by a uh, governmental mandate with arbitrary value imposed by the feds. Uh, and, and the only backing that that fear, uh, fiat U.S. dollar had uh, moving forward was uh, the U.S. Uh, trust and the ability to pay uh, their bills and, and our bills uh, because there was no longer gold to back it up. Now, obviously, 
uh, that created fiat money because at the end of the day, you know, what if the United States is not able to pay their bills at some point in time in the future? Now, they're going to try to do the very best uh, for that never to happen because if we get into that situation, then bankruptcy would be right around the corner and then all of a sudden, uh, our ability to borrow money throughout the world uh, is going to go out the, uh, out the window or we ha- we're going to have to pay substantial amounts in interest rates in order to be able to borrow money from, from abroad. So, you know, not paying our bills. Now, by the way, in many different ways, you know, we haven't been able to pay our bills for many, many years. And the only way we actually pay them is by printing more and more money. Uh, and that creates another issue that we'll discuss in the next few minutes. Uh, but that's about the only um, the only thing that we have right now, the U.S. ability uh, to pay its bills uh, moving forward uh, into the future. So uh, I think the next question is, um, because some of you have asked me to talk a little bit about gold, you know, why are we having this conversation today? Um, and, and we're having it for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, the printing of money by the U.S. government actually creates uh, immediate inflation. And the reason for that is that the more money in circulation, the less your money is worth. So it's a matter of supply and demand. So the more uh, money that gets printed by the U.S. government, you know, the, le- the, 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 least, um, uh, the less value uh, that you actually have in your pocket with all the dollars that you're carrying around uh, in order to pay your bills and maintain your standard of living. Now, when you take a look at uh, our debt today in this country, and, you know, obviously every single podcast I talk a little bit about this, you know, we have a $27 trillion national debt. We actually have a national deficit now of $3.2 trillion, and that number continues to increase every single day. We have $155 trillion in unfunded liabilities. Those are uh, all of those promises that the U.S. government has made to to all of us and to the world that we don't have the money to pay for it today. So at the end of the day, I would argue uh, that um, uh, bankruptcy is right around the corner. We're going to have to be able to do something really, really fast or we're not going to be able to get away from bankruptcy. Now, what are some of the things that we're going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to raise taxes, not just for everyone that makes over $400,000. There are not that many of them to go around anyways. We're going to have to raise taxes to all of the masses because otherwise we're not going to be able to pay the money and we're going to become another Greece uh, in the next uh, 10 years, uh, more or less, depending on you know which publication you're going to be uh, reading at any point in time. Now... Uh, in many different ways, a link between the dollar and gold makes the, the federal government uh, powerless uh, to recessions and depressions. Um, but, you know, who causes most of them anyways? If you really think about the feds, you know, if you take a look at the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, and I wrote this in my book, which I'll start talking about next week, which is going to be published now next week on Amazon, and I'm going to give you the information on the book so all of you can feel free to, to purchase it uh, if you wish to do so. But if you take a look at the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, number one, is not federal. Number two, it has no reserves, and number three, it's not, bank, it's not a bank. So how do you get away with that? How can you call it the Federal Reserve Bank when it's not federal, it has no reserves, and it's not a bank? Uh, and that's what the government does, and that's what the Feds do on an ongoing basis because um, they're the ones that are causing um, uh, recessions and depressions every single day and every single year just by increasing or decreasing the money supply. And this is something that they do um, uh, you know, whenever we have a, uh, someone new in power or we need to create some uh, stability or instability all throughout the world, then we have the, the power, well, not we, but the Federal Reserve has the power to, to uh, manage and dictate monetary policy throughout the United States and the world. Now, although Europe uh, no longer uses a gold standard, the euro is controlled by checks and balances. So, in, in, in many different ways, uh, Euro members are part of a fixed currency union, and individual countries are held to the guidelines of all group members. So that means that, you know, if you're part of the um, uh, the, the Euro world or you're, you're a Euro member, then that means that you're going to have to live based on a fixed currency pricing that is dictated 
by the Euro Union. So if you really give that a little bit of thought, it's like it's similar to having a gold standard backing behind it because you can only do so much and, and the European Union are the ones that are going to dictate uh, what the price of that fixed currency uh, is uh, as far as the euro. Now, individual countries are actually held to the guidelines of the group. So individual member uh, members uh, really have very little power as opposed to many of the mem members get together and then they want to impose uh, an increase or decrease in the value of the euro from one year to the next. So in many different ways, is more of a, um, a sophisticated gold standard that is dictated by uh, members of the of the whole, as opposed to individual members of the European Union. Now, more than likely, I would argue that you know the U.S. and the world uh, will never go back to the gold standard, um, and the reason for that is the world has changed uh, changed uh, dramatically you know, in the last uh, 50 to, to, to 60 years, and it will continue to change. Um, if we were try, trying to go back to the gold standard, and now there are certain uh, libertarians in, in government that would love to, to see us, you know, going back to the gold standard, and I'm a libertarian myself, although, you know, I have a strong economic background and accounting background, uh, I would love to be able to go back to the gold standard, uh, because at the end of the day, we have to be able to protect ourselves uh, from our own uh, government and politicians that are trying to di dictate policy that most of the times um, are not beneficial to, to any one of us. But if we were trying to, if we would try to go back to the gold standard today, it would be a little bit too restrictive for today's markets and, and economic environments. You know, 50, 60 years ago, the world uh, kind of moved uh, very slowly. Today, the, the, the world is very, very fast, and the world has gotten smaller and smaller. And that's due to, you know, social media and technology. I mean, something happens in the U.S. Uh, this morning, and within 30 minutes, the entire world knows uh, what, ha ha what has happened. Actually, I would argue within seconds, the world uh, would know uh, what has happened. So uh, the gold standard um, actually limits the power of government. Uh, so my question to all of you, is it really a bad thing? Is it really for is it really a bad thing for the gold and for the gold standard uh, to limit uh, the power of government? Um, I would argue, uh, no, it's not a bad thing. I think the challenge is, um, you know, it's like uh, once you throw the first punch, you can't take it back. Uh, you can't take it back. So it's going to be almost an impossibility for us to be able to go back to the to the gold uh, standard. Now, uh, the U.S., and this is according to, to the latest uh, statistics that I have read, uh, the U.S. owns, uh, uh, owns the most amount of gold in the world, and it's, uh, it's heavily protected, as you all know. And we have somewhere, uh, somewhere close to $500 billion uh, in uh, gold, uh, which is uh, heavily protected. And it's just sitting there. Uh, and, and it's something that, you know, we're very proud of, but it's not having an, a, a positive or a negative impact on anything that we do uh, throughout the world, unless there's some kind of an economic destruction of the entire world and paper money is worthless, you know, as it is today, because, you know, fiat money is worthless because it has no backing other than a promissory note. Uh, from the U.S. government. So um, understanding, uh, you know, all about uh, gold, and, and there's some great books at all. I have read probably four or five books on, on the gold standard uh, and going back to the gold standard and the pluses and the minuses and the pros and the cons. Uh, but, you know, understanding a little bit of gold and understanding the, the impact of gold, you know, what what are some of the things that you can do in order to protect uh, yourself, your family, your business, and your retirement assets uh, from uh, this mandate from um, uh, from the federal government, remember they're uh, they're the ones that can dial up and dial down inflation, recessions, uh, and depressions in this country, um, and and none of us have have uh, any power of uh, controlling what's going to happen unless. Uh, you take an individual approach to take a look at your your personal economy and see how you can protect uh, yourself 
uh, your family and your business from anything that may be happening uh, in the next several years or in the next 20 years uh, throughout your retirement life uh, at least is something that you should pay attention to. Now, uh, what, are so, what are some of the things that you can do? Well, number one, uh, you can create your own uh, gold standard. Uh, by having a portion of your retirement assets in gold and or silver. So in other words, you know, purchasing precious uh, metals uh, is something that would be very important to to all of you. Now, if you really think about this, uh, gold and silver are insurance policies that protect you from inflation. Uh, It also protects you from currency fluctuations and also protects uh, you and your family from uh, government uh, overspending and overreaching. So always having a percentage, you know, I always say that you cannot have all your, all your eggs in one, in, in one basket. And the same way that all of us do asset allocation in our retirement and our retirement portfolios and our, our, in our, in our non-retirement assets, you know, most of the time when we do asset allocation, we do asset allocation between uh, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Now, some of you that are real estate savvy may do uh, asset allocation between stocks, bonds, uh, mutual funds, um, uh, and real estate. Uh, and there are many different ways that you can diversify in, in real estate. Uh, but And then there are others uh, that may do uh, asset allocation uh, based on stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, index annuities, uh, fixed annuities, uh, and obviously uh, precious metals and real estate. So now the more you're able to diversify and the more you can, the more baskets that you have in your asset allocation, uh, the better off you're going to be in order to be able to combat uh, and, and fight against any intrusion from a governmental entity that may uh, want to impose uh, certain sanctions uh, to you and your family. Now, along with asset allocation, it's important to do tax allocation because um, that's going to be very critical because um, due to the fact that the gold standard is no, long, no, long, no longer around and the fact that we owe so much money and we don't have the money to be able to maintain all the benefits that we have promised uh, all of uh, all Americans and you know everyone that we owe money to throughout the world, then we all know that taxes are going to go heavily uh, up at some to- point in time in the very near future. So if you know that taxes are going to be uh, doubling in the next um, you know 10 to 15, perhaps even 20 years, and now you have to look at a 30-year retirement, then you better be able to start doing some tax planning allocation today because otherwise uh, asset allocation alone is not going to be enough for you. So if you want to use a portion of your qualified plan, um, i.e. a 401k, an IRA, a 403b, uh, then obviously you can always open a self-directed uh, IRA and you can execute the purchases. And there are companies that specialize in uh, self-directed IRAs that deal with uh, gold. Um, I don't have the time to go into any details, but that's something that if you can Google, you'll get a number of companies that will be able to do that for you. And it's always a good idea to have a, per- a percentage of that um, in in gold. Now. Uh, before you all of a sudden decide to open a self-directed IRA uh, in order to buy gold, uh, take a look at the guidelines and take a look at the rules of engagement when it comes to individual retirement accounts uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, you have to be careful because uh, uh, not all collectibles uh, are actually treated equally under the IRA, IRA rules. So um, collectibles uh, would actually violate the IRA rules, so you have to be careful about that. Now, uh, a better way to, to actually buy gold uh, would be through non-qualified accounts, you know, accounts that have nothing to do with your retirement accounts. And the other reason why I say that is if you buy gold inside inside an IRA, you know, once you get to the age of 72, you're going to have to, you know, do your required minimum distributions on an annual basis. So you want to have certain amount of liquidity uh, in order to be able to convert that gold to uh, to paper uh, and then take that distribution uh, from your retirement account. So uh, I always say to my clients that a better way to do it is to buy gold through a non-qualified account. And then you can obviously buy it in in many different ways. You can buy precious uh, metals um, directly, so you can buy actual actual gold and, and silver. Um, but 
the one thing that I can tell you, because I hear this often from some of the clients that I engage, you know, I get calls from clients, and whenever I do reviews with my clients, some of them may say, you know, Bert, you know, isn't gold a very good investment? Um, and, and I stopped them right then and there because uh, at the end of the day, you know, precious metals, uh, gold, uh, silver, etc., are not really investments. They're actually a hedge to currency and the increase in value uh, due to inflation and or uh, economic uncertainty. So if you have gold in, in, in your portfolio, don't treat it as an investment. Uh, treat it as, as hedging. You know, similar as, a, as an index annuity or, or a, um, uh, let's say, a fixed annuity or an immediate annuity that is going to provide you with a guaranteed paycheck for life, you know, that's a, that's a tremendous hedging. It's a tremendous hedging against uh, the risk of, you know, uh, running out of money before you run out of life because obviously you can hedge your bet and never run out of money before you actually run out of life. Uh, it's also a, get, a hedge against uh, stock market volatility, interest rate volatility. Uh, it's also a hedge against um, uh, taking too much money out of your retirement accounts and too soon. So, you know, by having immediate annuities and fixed index annuities and fixed annuities in your portfolio, you're actually creating a hedge uh, which is going to protect the rest of your retirement assets. And the same thing happens with gold and silver. You know, they're actually hedging uh, your bet. Uh, you're actually hedging your bet and you're not uh, looking at it from an investment standpoint, but it does protect many of the other investments that you would have inside of your portfolio. Now, one of the better ways that you can, that you can buy gold is uh, by purchasing, by purchasing uh, gold ETFs, which are, which are your, ex, um, uh, your exchange uh, traded funds. Um, and that's an alternative to owning gold itself as it provides instant liquidity if necessary. So if you buy gold ETFs inside of your retirement accounts, now many of you are not going to be able to buy ETFs because uh, most of the retirement accounts that I see often uh, do not carry uh, ETFs. They carry mutual funds, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. Uh, but if you have an IRA, if you open up an IRA or if you do a rollover, uh, with an IRA, you can actually uh, buy ETFs inside your individual IRAs. But at the corporate level, you know, most uh, financial institutions are not going to provide those ETFs uh, inside of those 401k accounts or 403bs and so forth. So it's, it's very important for you to understand uh, what are some of the things that you need to, to pay attention to because at the end of the day, you want to make certain that you can protect your family uh, from the potential increases of inflation uh, and the risk of uh, depre depression and deflation, which is another major issue for all of us to consider. So, you know, I'm hoping that, that, that you have enjoyed uh, a little bit of information and historical data and background on the, on the gold standard and, uh, and the impact of the gold standard on the U.S. economy. You know, obviously, uh, I was not around at that point in time, but I wish in many different ways that either we would have never gone out of the gold standard uh, uh, at all, or if we had, uh, had started to kind of move away from the gold standard, uh, gold standard that we would have done it on a percentage basis and at least have a percentage of our assets uh, protected by gold, um, not as it is today, because today is basically uh, fiat money and, and a promissory note from the U.S. government. So uh, for those of you, that may want to continue this conversation and may want to talk about, you know, some of, uh, some of the other issues regarding your, uh, your retirement accounts and, um, and your retirement life that may be keeping you awake at night, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. You can call me at area code 786-766-1042. You can also send me an email at bert, B-E-R-T, at bertsalazar.com, B-E-R-T-S-A-L-A-Z-A-R.com. And always remember that my goal for you and your family is to kind of help you change the way that you see things because when you change the way that you see things, then the, see, the things that you see actually start to change. So once again, happy Thanksgiving. Hopefully uh, you guys are ready for the turkey. Try not to eat too much because you're going to fall asleep on your, on your family and that's not something that you want. Uh, and I'll talk to you again next week. Uh, so have a great Thanksgiving and uh, be safe, be merry, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.